Uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you about all those other Gospels. I mean, all of them. All, Jan, Dan Brown said there were 84 of them. I've spent much of uh, the last two decades trying to find all those 84. I don't think there are 84. I'll tell you exactly how many I think there are in just a second. But basically, the missing Gospels were mostly missing from this conversation, except for a handful, like the Gospel of Thomas, which I'll be introducing you to in just a second, and some others, until Dan Brown came along with The Da Vinci Code. And that book sold like crazy, along with several movies. It was by far, for me, the most um, uh, busy time I've had interacting with media. It lasted about 18 months and uh, put me in all kinds of situations and conversations. And so I want to walk you through a little introduction about what these materials are, which will also explain why they never made it into the New Testament canon. You heard about the Old Testament canon earlier today from Scott. And I want to deal with one of the questions that, that came up pretty frequently. In fact, one of my most frustrating media interviews took place in Los Angeles uh, when I was being asked the question, why are you so concerned about this? This is a piece of fiction. To which um, my response was, well, you've got to understand that the way Dan Brown presented this was that yes, this was a piece of fiction, but the skeleton that he built it around, he claimed to be historical. And she must have asked me or made the observation that this was fiction about 18 times. And I made the same answer 18 times. On the 19th asking of the question in one form or another, I finally looked at her and said, look, you've asked me this question 18 times, and 18 times I've given you the same answer. This is going to be the answer I am going to give. Uh, and, and I think it explains why people are so concerned about this. It is a claim that behind the history of the early church was the uh, purposeful um, submersion of books claiming to represent different kinds of Christianity that existed from the very beginning. And that, that representation of history is false. And so... Uh, the claim that came with it was the claim that history was written by the winners and that these Gospels represented the losers in the debate who were subsequently suppressed by the early church. Now, there's no doubt that by the time we get to the 3rd and 4th century, there is a rejection of these materials that is going on. That's true. But the point that I want to make about it is, is that sometimes, and I actually... I actually um, I was involved in a documentary. I was interviewed for a documentary in which the missing Gospels were being discussed. And I talked to the producer who had been responsible for inviting me to do the interview and told him about what the background was to this material and talked through it, etc. And one of the lines that I had during the interview was, Yes, history is written by the, win by the winners, but sometimes the winners deserve to win. And, uh, and when she went to produce the documentary, which had been heavily written before she had done the interview with me, um, it was going to be a very pro-Missing Gospels piece. But she did the interview with me, and then she changed the way she did the documentary for three quarters of it, she told the story of the missing gospels, laid it out, laid it out much as she had planned. But then the last 15 minute segment was the rebuttal. And the last line in the documentary was, and sometimes the winners deserve to win. I got an email from Marvin Meyer, who teaches out in California at Claremont, or he did, he's now passed away. And we were often on the opposite sides of this discussion in the media. And his email was very short to me. It was, Daryl, you fox. You got that line in that documentary. <laughs> and so, uh, so that's the background of what we're talking about. The last time I gave a version of this particular lecture that I'm about to give to you now uh, was, at the, was in the classics department at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. This was less than a year ago. Uh, 
So, um, so I'm going to dive in. I'll tell you some of it's a little technical, but I think you'll be able to follow the basic points that I'm, that I'm trying to make. Basically, the basic claims of Dan Brown and alternative Christianities is that a revision of early Christian history is needed uh, and that Gnostic texts with its human Jesus and view of women can take us there. I wrote a book in response to the Da Vinci Code called Breaking the Da Vinci Code, and I wrote it because I was so angry at Newsweek magazine. Um, they had interviewed me twice uh, oh, for multiple hours about the Da Vinci Code. I had told them all kinds of historical detail about this period. And in the article that they ended up producing, it was basically a puff piece of the book, and they didn't use anything that I told them, and I was not happy. Uh, Frank Maloney, who was dean of the Catholic University here in the D.C. area at the time, also interviewed long and hard with them, giving them some of the same information. So they even had two witnesses to corroborate the story, which is what you know the journalistic standard, at least in many contexts, is supposed to be. And, uh, and they didn't use any of his stuff either. And we happened to meet a few weeks later talking about our experience with Newsweek. And so this was called Two Grumpy Men. And, uh, and so we talked to one another about this and, and what should be done. And I told him I was contemplating doing a book on the Da Vinci Code that I knew how I wanted it, how I wanted it to go, etc. I just hadn't submitted the, the proposal yet. Not a week later, I get a call from a publisher who says, we want to do a book in response to Da Vinci Code, and we've been given your name by someone, I don't know where that came from, would you do the book? And I said, how soon do you want it? And they said, as soon as possible. I said, what does that mean? As soon as possible, which wasn't helping me very much. Uh, and, and this would happen in the middle of November. I said, well, I've got two holidays coming up. You can figure out what they are, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'll see if I can get you something by the end of the year. I hold up with uh, 60 of my closest wife's relatives over Thanksgiving and took the mornings only to write afternoons I was with them and did the book in five days. Um, and it's the best-selling book I've ever written. My wife says to me, you should do another five-day book. I say, it's not that easy. And so, uh, so anyway, so the, the gist of this effort was to argue there were always a variety of Christianities around and that um, they had some of them had a very different Christology and many of them were very pro-female and that was the thrust of the Newsweek piece you can probably go back and look it up if you wanted to well I want to test that thesis so I've taken too long for the introduction that or longer than I wanted I wanted the slides to go forward there we go here is the list of Gospels that I am aware of, okay? There are 29 that have names, and there are seven where simply the material that they are found on or the name of where they were found is uh, what the title is. These are mostly, this is important, these are mostly not Gospels in the way we're used to them. In other words, they're not run through narratives of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Most of these, there are a few exceptions, are post-resurrection discussions with Jesus, which are designed to, um, to overshadow the story of Jesus' earthly ministry in the Gospels. I'm just going to go through, I'm going to read through the list. I shouldn't take the time to do this, but this is just too much fun to pass up. Okay? It's the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocryphon of James, the Apocryphon of John, which is probably one of the major texts coming out of this period. We have four versions of it found at a place called Nag Hammadi, two in a long version and two in a shorter version. So there was both the full Apocryphon of John and then what we might call the Reader's Digest version for those who are hard of reading. And then you've got the Dialogue of the Savior, 
eugnostos the blessed, excerpta ex theodoto, the gospel of Bartholomew, the gospel of the Egyptians, the gospel of Mary Magdalene, some of which you have heard more recently about because of the Jesus wife text that was a big deal a few years ago. The gospel of Judas, the gospel of Nicodemus, which equals the Acts of Pilate, they're the same thing. Gospel of Peter, gospel of Philip, gospel of the Savior, gospel of Thomas, the most important of these, because this is a collection of alleged sayings of Jesus, some of which do overlap with, with canonical gospel material that we have. This is a mixture of stuff. It's a hybrid. Some of it coming out of the tradition that we also see feeding into the gospels and the other stuff coming from elsewhere. That's the most fascinating part of this collection. The Gospel of Thomas the Contender, the Proto-Evangelium of James, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew, the Gospel of Truth. I love this one. This should be a title of a movie. The Hypostasis of the Archons. Okay? I mean, that, that, I mean just, just imagine what they could do through technology with that. That's actually the existence of the rulers is what that translates into. Um, the Interpretation of Knowledge, the Letter to Regainos, also known as the Treatise on the Resurrection, Pistis Sophia, the second treatise of the Great Seth. Apparently we haven't found the first treatise of the Great Seth yet. Sophia of Jesus Christ, Teachings of Salvanus, the Tripartite Tractate, a Valentinian Exposition, and then Fragments. The Papyrus Egerton II, the Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 840, there'll be a spelling quiz later, the Strasbourg Coptic Papyrus, and then mentioned but not found are the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Gospel of the Nazareans, the Gospel of Mattathias, and the Gospel of the Ebionites. As far as I know, that is the list. It's 29 texts plus seven other pieces of material. When I do the math, that's 36, way short of 84. I have never been able to figure out where the number 84 came from. Unless it's all the New Testament apocryphal works, but I didn't bother to sit down and count those because most of those are not Gospels. So anyway, so that's, that's the list. Now, how do I want to handle this in the uh, immense amount of time that I have left? And it's, it's this. I want to talk about what this material mostly is, and I want to compare some of its content to what you already know about the Christian theology, okay? So I'm going to talk about the nature of the missing Gospels. The movement that produced most of these texts comes out of Greek Neoplatonism. Now, I said we're going to get technical, so this is the captain on the airplane saying, fasten your seatbelts, we're going to experience a little turbulence, but I'm here right alongside you, okay? So these are ideas... It's ideas and the spiritual that matters. Anything that material, anything that stuff doesn't matter and is not important. In fact, it's corrupt. It's evil. And so what really matters is understanding who you are spiritually, not anything about your body or whatever. And we'll talk about two different ways that manifested itself in what's called Christian Gnosticism in a minute. Um, and so God is not a creator. Uh, underling gods are, matter is evil, matter is unredeemable, Jesus is, is not so much a, tran he's a transcendent figure, but he is more an illuminator about our spiritual capabilities than he is a savior from sin. Um, he didn't really truly suffer on the cross. He's, he's not uh, truly human at all, because that would mean taking on matter and a transcendent being wouldn't do that. So he has the appearance of being human. We'll see some texts that say this. And the reason uh, this is good to know is because these are mysteries that only some people have figured out. Now, mysteries are really cool. Okay? You want to be connected to mysteries. You want to be, you know, inquiring minds want to know. And so, so that's what this is, is talking about. So what I want to do is I want to look at how these are like and unlike the Gospels. And to do that, um, I'm going to go through four areas super quickly. One is going to be God and creation. The next is going to be the person of Jesus. The third is going to be the nature and scope of salvation. And the fourth is going to be the work of Jesus. Now, I'm going to assume something to save time, and that is 
that you know some basic things about what Christianity teaches in each of those areas. And we're just going to compare through a, a variety of texts um, what this material is teaching. So I'm going to start off with, um, with the God and creation. And this is, this is why this, this, is, this is fun stuff in the sense that it's interesting. You know, what some people believed in this period, the Apocryphon of John I've already mentioned, is probably the most important text found at Nag Hammadi. Nag Hammadi is where we found many of these missing Gospels. It was a huge collection, collection and library of a variety of things. And the Apocryphon with John was probably written in the mid-2nd century. And I want you to contrast it with the Old Testament. And I've already suggested its importance. This was probably the most widely circulated of these texts in the second century. So I'm going to tell you the creation story that comes from the Apocryphon of John. And you're just going to have to hang in with me a little bit. And the names will be strange. But just keep with me. I'll try and take you through this. In the Apocryphon of John, the second section, 233 to 410, I'm giving you the verses so you can have your devotions in it later, is a long description of God's uniqueness. And here's some of what's said. He is, quote, more than a God, and nothing is above Him. He is illimitable, total perfection, immeasurable, invisible, eternal, unnameable, pure, holy, not corporeal. See, you can't take on a bodily attributes. Superior from other beings among a variety of attributes. He is an eon giving eon. That's 4.3. He is at rest. It was His thought that performed a deed and she came forth. Now we're going to deal with female transcendent beings. She is the forethought of the all. That's 4.31 and 32. And the glory of the barbello. The barbello is the invisible virginal spirit. Next is named a series of eons that came from the Father. Okay, it goes on. And it goes on in this way. The key event follows. Sophia, an eon herself, conceives of a thought from herself, and she sought to conceive without her consort's consent. And what was produced was imperfect and different from her appearance, a lion-faced serpent called Yaltabaoth, the first archon to take the power from his mother. Now, don't blast by that. That's, that's important. The creation doesn't come from the top eon. It comes from a female transcendent eon, and she botches the job at the beginning. Now just think about Genesis 1 for a second. God created and it was very good. Okay? So, the lion face, the first archon from the power of his mother. He is also called the great ruler. Here is the start of evil emerging from an act independent of the highest God. See, one of the things that happened is she acted completely independent from the knowledge of the top eon. So it was an act of rebellion as well. Not only was it poorly executed, okay, but it was an act of rebellion as well. Very different than Genesis 1. And it's important to remember that the earliest Christianity accepted the inspiration of the Hebrew Scriptures. So, here's the start of evil emerging from an act independent of the highest God. A woman, Sophia, acts on her own. She repents and asks for forgiveness. So at least give her credit, she saw the error of her ways. Continues. At least I think it continues. Let's see if I can get that. Um, let's see, I need to go one more slide. Yaltabaoth moves to create the first man, which chapters 15 and 16 detail part by part. Later the command of the mother and father of all sends five lights to Yaltabaoth to tell him to breathe into the being a breath. Unknown to him, Yaltabaoth breathes into the body an element of power from his mother. The being moves and comes to life. The archons will have power over the natural perceptible body, but in him was an epinoia, that's a thought or a mind idea, hidden in Adam that was the correction, correction of the mother's deficiency. So here's what's going on. The, the creation of humanity 
doesn't go back to God. It doesn't even go back to Sophia. Okay, we, if you think about, um, this illustration works better in Europe. You know, in Europe, you've got the premier division of soccer, and then you've got division two and division three. All right, all right. So this is a creation by a God who isn't in the major leagues, and he isn't even in the triple A, okay? This is a double A God doing the creating, all right? And the problem is so problematic that a uh, breath is given, a spiritual breath to Yaltabav who breathes us into Adam and that's how Adam becomes a spiritual being so that his spiritual presence matters but his physical body doesn't. Okay? Now this sounds like the Old Testament, doesn't it? So that is the creation story from the Apocryphon of John. Now the second theme is the person of Jesus. And this relates to a variety of claims coming from a variety of sources. And so I want to look at these really quickly as well. I'm having a little trouble. There we go. See if I can get that. Here is saying 77 from the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is 114 alleged sayings of Jesus. Written probably somewhere around the end of the first to the beginning of the second century. I've already told you it's a hybrid. It's a little bit like you read 25% of this and you say, I could be reading the Gospels. You read another 25% and you go, well, that's sort of like the Gospels. And you read another 50% and you go, I've never heard anything like this before. So it's a real mix. So here's what saying 77 in the Gospel of Thomas has to say. I mean, I should do this in a British voice. Jesus said, it is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the light the all. From me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. Okay? Now, obviously, this is a declaration of the fact that God is, that Jesus is in everything, and is kind of omnipresent. Okay, so that doesn't sound uh, quite so strange, but but there it is. Well, what exactly is this Jesus like? Now, another saying in Thomas is saying 13. This is my, one of my favorite passages in the missing Gospels. This is the equivalent of Caesarea Philippi in the Gospel of Thomas. You remember Caesarea Philippi is where Jesus asks, who do men say that I am? And Peter steps forward and says, you are the Christ or you're the Christ of God, or you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, depending on which gospel you're citing. Okay, But basically the confession is, you're the Christ. Here is Thomas's version of this, and this is, this is just simply uh, a marvelous text. Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to someone and tell me who I am like. Simon Peter said to him, you are like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, you are like a wise philosopher. Thomas, now this is the Gospel of Thomas, so this is the good answer. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying who you are like. You are a mystery who cannot be described. That's basically the thrust of that answer. Jesus replied, I am not your master. Now here grammar makes a difference. The your here is a second person singular. He is just talking to Thomas here. He says, because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring which I have measured out. Jesus then takes Thomas aside for a private discussion. Oh wow, they talk over here together and they have a little confab and it's really cool because only Thomas gets to be a part of this secret private conversation. It's really neat. When the disciples asked Thomas about the conversation, see, he eventually had to join the other group. And see, inquiring minds want to know, hey, Thomas, what did you discuss with Jesus? That, was, that looked like a pretty fascinating private discussion you were having. His reply was that if he mentioned any of the things, they would pick up stones and fire would come out of the stones and burn them. Now that's a fancy way of saying, I'm not telling you. It's going to remain a mystery. I know, and you don't. And if I were to tell you, 
It's like, you know, being a member of a secret in the government. If I tell you, I'd have to kill you, okay? So that's kind of where we're, where we're at. It, it protects the mystery. Part of the attraction of these materials was the idea that it left that these are post-resurrection conversations in which some people know stuff that the masses of people don't know. In fact, a certain apostle in this case knows something that the other apostles don't know. That's part of how it worked. So here are the points that come from Thomas. First, there is a high Christology because Jesus' role is inexpressible. That's true. Second, there is an emphasis on a held secret not to be revealed to everyone, reflecting the elite and secret side of this movement. Complete contrast to the New Testament where people are to have revealed to them without exception who Jesus is. Third, Jesus' response has Thomas's reply about being incomparable, especially in mind, and affirms the inexpressible Jesus over other options. Those who embrace Thomas's reply know something that others do not. And that's really cool. Here's another example of the same kind of thing, and this is about Jesus' death. So I'm kind of transitioning here, even though I'm still talking about the person of Jesus. This comes from the Apocalypse of Peter, 81 through 723. I, Peter, said, What am I seeing, O Lord? Is it you yourself whom they take? And are, and are you holding on to me? And who is the one above the cross? So we're at Jesus' crucifixion. Who is this one above the cross who is glad and laughing? Some of these texts have a laughing Jesus because people think they're crucifying Jesus, but his transcendent part has escaped before he went on the cross. Those of you who know Islam know that Islam sometimes has this view of Jesus. It says, it is, And is it another person whose feet and ham, hands they are hammering? The Savior said to me, He whom you see above the cross, glad and laughing, is the living Jesus. But he on whose hands and feet they are driving the nails is his physical part, which is the substitute. They are putting to shame that which is his likeness. Let me translate that for you. Jesus did not die on the cross, which is one of the reasons why he didn't die for sin, because he wasn't there. So you can see this is very, very different you know, if there are alternative Christianities out there, they're very alternative. Let's talk about women. Because remember I said one of the themes was that, you know, they build up women. Now, I've already suggested to you there's a problem here. Because the creation, remember that story, was botched because of a woman. Okay, it's a little bit my, like my walking into the kitchen and saying to my wife, it's all your fault. All right, so that's where we're, we're coming from. Here are some more sayings that deal with the theme of the salvation and women. And I'm just going to do a couple of these for the sake of time. The first one comes, again, from the Gospel of Thomas. And it reads this way. If the flesh came into being because of the Spirit, it is a wonder. Well, first we're going to deal with the physicality of creation. But if the Spirit came into the being because of the body, it is a wonder of wonders. Indeed, I am amazed at how this great wealth has made its home in this poverty. So this is the idea of how is it that something as precious as a spiritual reality can choose to reside in a physical shell? Okay? And they're basically saying, that's amazing that it would happen that way. But that's part of the mystery. Okay, well, what about women? Okay, this is another one. I have lots of favorite texts. This is another one of my favorite texts from this material. In the Gospel of Thomas 1.14, Peter is seeking to send Mary away because she is not worthy of kingdom life as a woman. Not exactly an affirming text. Jesus replies, this is how he's going to defend this. This is how Jesus is going to defend this. I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she may become a living spirit resembling you males for every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom. Now that is about as pro-female a text as I think I've ever seen. I remember giving this lecture 
in a, in a varied form at Elmhurst College, which is known for not being conservative. And someone walked up to me afterwards and said, is that a real text? And I said, yes. And he said, I thought this stuff was pro-female. I said, that's why I quoted that text. So, um, so is this and the Gnostic view of creation pro-female? Not only are women not resp- are responsible for a, a woman goddess or transcendent eon, better way to say it, is responsible for the botched creation at the beginning, but a woman, in order to experience redemption, has got to become a male. Newsweek had it wrong. Here's a text that when I read, I do, when I'm all done, I go, I have no idea what this just said. But I want you to enjoy it with me. Okay? So here we go. This is Reginos 47 and 48. Nothing then redeems us from this world, but the all which we are, we are saved. Okay, we're part of this, you know, kind of cosmic unity. We have received salvation from end to end. Let us think this way. Let us comprehend this way. But there are some who wish to understand in the inquiry about those things they are looking into, whether he who is saved, if he leaves his body behind, will be saved immediately. Let no one doubt concerning this, indeed. The visible members which are dead shall not be saved. Okay? Play taps over the physical body. For only the living members which exist within them would arise. Now notice, this is in contrast to the New Testament. The New Testament believes in a bodily resurrection, a physical resurrection that also has a spiritual element in it. Okay? Not a partial resurrection, which is what this is defending. What then is the resurrection? It is always the disclosure of those who have risen. Meditate on that in your spare time. Okay? Next one's Jesus' work. We've already suggested some of this, but we'll take a look at some of this. Here is Thomas 1.11. Jesus said, The heavens and the earth will be rolled up in your presence, and the one who lives from the living one will not see death. Does not Jesus say, say, whoever finds himself is superior to the world. Salvation is discovering simply who you are in yourself as a spiritual being. That's what that is saying. Again, different from the New Testament. The next text, Apocalypse of Peter, 70 and 71. Um, Peter, blessed are those belonging to the Father, for they are heavenly. It is He, the Father, who revealed life to those who are from life through me. I reminded those who are built on what is strong that they should heed my instruction and distinguish between words of unrighteousness and transgression of law on the one hand and righteousness on the other, since they are from the height of every word of this fullness of truth. Graciously they have been enlightened by Him whom the principality sought. The only thing that I know about what that is saying is Somehow, the people who know the mystery know the mystery. That's salvation. To understand who you are. Now, I want to contrast this with the early orthodoxy of the second century. This is a creed that I have constructed that is the summary of writings of the first two centuries of orthodox Christians. What I did in the book Missing Gospels is I went through, you know, all the Missing Gospels material. Took a year to do this. Went through all the Missing Gospels material. And then I read through all the early church stuff up to Irenaeus because Irenaeus, in the alternative Christianity's view, is seen as the father of orthodoxy. We didn't have our orthodoxy till we got to Irenaeus and he insisted on a canon and talked about the center of the faith, etc. So I said, well, let's take all the orthodox pieces that were written before Irenaeus ever wrote and see if they have a unified story, if there's a unified doctrine. And the answer to that question was yes, there was. And virtually every sentence in here I can find in multiple texts 
New, Test New Testament and early church father texts before we get to Irenaeus. And here's the summary of that content. There was one Creator God. Jesus was both human and divine. He truly suffered and was raised bodily to be our representative and offer forgiveness to all. He also is worthy to receive worship. Salvation was about liberation from hostile forces, but it also was about sin and forgiveness. The need to fix a flaw in humanity that made each person accountable and culpable before the Creator. This salvation was the realization of promises that God made to the world and to Israel through Israel's law and prophets. You heard about that earlier. The one person, Jesus Christ, brought this salvation not only by revealing the way to God and making reconciliation, but also by providing for that way through His death for sin. Resurrection into a new, exalted spiritual life involves salvation of the entire person, spirit, soul, and body. Faith in this work of God through Jesus saves and brings on a spiritual life that will never end. This was the orthodoxy of the earliest tradition, by which I mean the writings that come before Irenaeus. I'm going to point out four areas, four details where the missing gospel's content does not match orthodoxy. Any one of these would, would disqualify this material, but all four are present in much of this literature. Here we go. This orthodoxy can be stated in terms of what was to be excluded and included. First, God was not to be divided in such a way that He was not the Creator. God was the creator of all things, and that initial creation was good. Obviously standing in contrast to the Apocryphon of John. Second, a division between Jesus and the Christ in terms of his basic person and work was not acceptable. Orthodoxy was that Jesus truly came in the flesh and truly suffered. Third, redemption only on a spiritual plane was not the true faith. Salvation included a physical dimension of resurrection and extended into the material creation. Romans 8 says, all creation groans for the redemption that is to come. And then fourth, Jesus did not come only to point the way to faith, to be a prophet, or merely a teacher of religious wisdom, or to be a mere example of religious faith, or to lead us into self-discovery, for that matter. Rather, his work provided the means to salvation. He was more than a prophet, which is why he was worshipped. So that's another way to say this. So I'm about ready to wrap up real quickly. Here's what I'm saying. Crossing any of those four points led to a charge of not being orthodox. The Gnostic texts and the missing Gospels are not the way in, but the way out from God. Three key points. The claim that Gnostic Christians existed alongside Orthodox Christians at the start of Christianity is simply false. I'm quoting Ben Witherington there. Gnostic texts are too late and too distant to be tied to the Jewish Jesus. Most of these texts that we're talking about are mid-2nd century and beyond. Two, yet another falsehood that revisionist historians espouse is that there was no core belief system in the 1st century that could later be called Orthodoxy. To show that was a major burden of my book, Missing Gospels, because I go through these writings all the way up to Irenaeus and summarize them so that people can see the theme running through all these writings. Third, the adoption of the Hebrew Scriptures as canon, that's by the early church, meant that Gnosticism would have never been recognized as a legitimate development of the Christian faith. The view of the Creator God and accountability to him was most important in the rejection of Gnosticism and Gnostic Christians. Notice what I'm saying there. I am not saying it's their view of Jesus that was the point of defection. It was their view of God the Creator and the creation that was the problem, that was the major problem. Even though there were problems with Jesus, the more basic problem was their, was their problems with the Creator God. So what are we saying about Dan Brown's work? Well, it's this. Dan's Brown, Dan Brown's work was fiction through and through. 
He claimed the background was reflective of historical realities tied to the Christian church, and that is patently false. But the factors that we have traced show the beliefs he believed were expunged cannot be re reflect the earliest faith of disciples of a Jewish-rooted Jesus. It can't go back to the earliest group of disciples who embraced the faith and who embraced the Hebrew Scriptures as the basis for their message, as you heard earlier today. If you accept those Hebrew Scriptures, you will not go into the Gnostic category. And if you accept those Hebrew Scriptures, you will not have alternative Christianities in the way these texts are reflected. Thank you very much.